What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on a mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Bastian Künzel, and he introduces to me the design principles of story and how he applies them to workshop design and the design of any educational experience. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you visit workshops.work, search for the episode and download my nuggets that I compiled for you. So lean back and enjoy the show. Hello, Bastian. Hello, Miriam. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I am very much looking forward to learn about your storytelling principles that you apply to workshops. Yeah, cool. That's nice. <laughs> Maybe before we get to the core of it, you can tell us a little bit about yourself. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? Do you actually do? Yes. I mean, I, to, I don't know the day, you know, when I thought like, oh, I'm going to start calling myself a facilitator now. But I think it was just for a very long time, it was just the name of the job that people that I admired did. And then when I got to the position where I would do that job, I thought like, okay, I guess I'm a facilitator now. Because my my educational work originates in international youth work. Mm -hmm. And so it was always based around non-formal education, around like youth camps, youth exchanges, working on human rights education or intercultural learning or citizenship education and, and stuff like that. So there was never a teacher there. And it was always also not necessarily always a trainer in the room, but sometimes the position of the person facilitating the workshop was called a facilitator. So it was very early on, it was a concept that made sense to me. And it was a, a thing people who I admired did. And so I strive to do the same thing. And then at some point, I, I learned that, oh, they do that as their job, like that's what they do. And I thought, okay, I guess I could do that too. So I I started basically coming out of university. I immediately became a full-time freelance facilitator and trainer and doing this work. And in the beginning with youth and then later on with, with corporations as well. Wonderful. Where would you see the difference between a facilitator and a trainer? A facilitator to me creates an environment and creates a process for people to learn something, but does not necessarily provide the input mm -hmm. of what is there to be learned, right? So the, the insights are being generated from within the process, mm -hmm. from within the minds and the ideas and the creativity of the people that are in the room. And a trainer to me is someone who gives an input as well, who adds some knowledge, who adds some perspectives, who adds some some stuff, right? But is is there also to put something into the minds of the people that are in the room. And a facilitator to me is someone who is really just there to clear the path, right? To to create the environment where learning can take place, but who isn't responsible and who doesn't feel also a mandate to be a source. Right? It's just there for the guidance, not as a source of insight. Yeah. And holding the space. Holding the space, yeah. And since we're into semantics, and the, since you're also into education, we come to that later. Where do you see the difference, if you don't mind asking me the question, where do you see the difference between educator and a trainer? To me, the term educator is kind of an umbrella term, mm. right? And... To me, a facilitator is an educator, a trainer is an educator, mm -hmm. a teacher is an educator, a professor is an educator, a lecturer is an educator, a speaker is an educator, a social worker is an educator. I would go as far as to say a manager is an educator. 
In the best right. scenario. In the best case. Right? <laughs> I mean, all of them in the best case. <laughs> right? There are teachers who aren't educators. There are professors who aren't educators. Right? But uh, th that to me is the umbrella term, is all the people who are in the field of helping others learn. Mm. Right? In whatever structure, in whatever form, in whatever format, in whatever forum that takes place. That's all educators to me. And then the, there's some specific professions within that that have a specialization on either a space, you know, like a university or a training room or a, a I don't know, a youth club, right? Or have a specialization on a, on a content or have a specialization on a process, right? But, uh, but those are all in the area of education to me. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I with the audience as well. Wow. How did you make the jump from working in the youth movement to corporations? Was this something that happened to you or did you make this step kind of consciously as a strategic move into I'm out of university, I'm an adult and I'm a facilitator now? <laughs> Well, the most pragmatic reason was you don't earn very well in the youth field. And I, you know, was starting to have a family and starting to have, a, you know, more responsibilities just over my own life, but over other people as well. And so one thing was like, oh, I guess, you know, I'm going to have to look for opportunities to make a little bit more money with the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was very skeptical at first if I really want to go there because it was always like, oh, you got to sell your soul when you work with corporations or it was just, you know, just about the money. And so what I did was I, I met with a, a friend of my wife who used to work in a, a youth education organization and then went to work for a corporation in the HR department there. And I just thought, okay, let's have a coffee. And uh, I, I just want to hear about how it is there. Yeah. And if I make an offer to a, a company, how much can I ask for a day? You know, because I had no idea. Mm. And so we <laughs> we met and we had a coffee. And he said, you know what? I'm just at actually in the beginning of this really big international training program And for this thing, I need a session on the topic of culture. Do you think you could design me a session on the topic of culture and then just teach me how to facilitate it? Mm. And you get, you know, a little bit of money for it. And I said, okay, uh, I can do that because I, I have a degree in intercultural communication. So, I, you know, that was something that would come very easy to me. And so I did that. And then he invited me to this company to run a trial session of this one session with him and two other people from the HR department. And we did that. And and then afterwards, he asked me, all right, this is great. We're going to use that. Uh, can I just show you the overall training program that we are thinking of? And maybe you have some feedback or some ideas. And so I I looked with him at this and I essentially completely redesigned it. And then he said, all right, now that you've completely redesigned it, you kind of need to co-facilitate it with me now, at least in the first two places where we're going to do this, in Germany and in Poland. And so we did that. And then afterwards he said, ah, you know what? You're not, now we're a team. Now we're doing this together. You need to come with me to Brazil, China, and India as well to run this training program there as well. <laughs> and that was kind of my initiation into the corporate world and and then from there it was then just a few lucky accidents or incidents and i was never very strategic in terms of you know finding client or marketing myself or, or stuff like that it was mostly then word of mouth and very very slowly very organically i grew a a clientele base of some corporations, but also I still work with the Council of Europe's youth sector. I still work with other international institutions in the area of youth, but I also work with uh, with corporations. Wonderful. And to what extent did you revisit what you learned at university about intercultural communication after this around the world tour, basically, on your first gig? Yeah, you know, it was so interesting because we had exactly the same program to implement uh, in all those places 
did. Right. And then you could really see like, okay, when you do group work and then a presentation of the group work in Germany, the group would work. And then one person who wouldn't be appointed, or just one person would get up and quickly present it. In India, uh, the entire group would come to the front of the room. They would introduce who was in the team. They would talk a little bit about how great it was to work in this team, how creative and how uh, enjoyable the process was. And then they would present the work and each one would have a little bit to say. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was just such a, you know, like a, an indication of, oh, wow, this is really, this is really different, you know, and that was, that was fascinating. Mm, would you incorporate these differences now in the design of a training or a workshop? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I run a lot of intercultural trainings where it's about, you know, how to work in diverse environments, how to work with teams where people are either remote all over the world or where you just have a lot of cultural diversity in your team or just in your organization. And so I take that into account, but it's always in balance with, you know, how much time do you have? How many people do you have in the room? What topics do you have to, you know, touch base on so that you achieve the results that you have to achieve? So, you know, it, it fits into the design, but it's not that I travel now a lot to Brazil or India or China all the time. And have, I mean, the last time I ran a training in China, there was one Chinese person in the team and most other people were German. And then there were a couple of Americans too. You know, like it's, so it's, it's mostly that it's, it's a very colorful group of people. And then you work with that intercultural diversity that you have in the room. Mm. Mm. And how did you get into storytelling? I mean, I didn't get into storytelling. To me, it's... <laughs> Why did I interview you? <laughs> Sorry. I love stories. <laughs> and I think that everything is a story and every experience is a story. Mm -hmm. You don't need to tell stories for there to be stories. Mm -hmm. There are stories happening all the time. You don't need a narrator of a story. Mm -hmm. Every great trainer uses a bunch of stories all the time. We tell anecdotes, we t use case studies, we use, you know, that's a usage of stories that is not in any way or form innovative to use storytelling in, in education, right? <laughs> we do this. What I find more interesting is to think about why stories are so captivating mm -hmm. and why stories are so effective in transporting an insight, right? Mm -hmm. And one way that that works is because you have a story that has a protagonist and the people that listen to the story have empathy with the protagonist. So the protagonist of the story has an insight and through the empathy, the listener of the story can have the same insight as if it was them who were in the story, mm -hmm. right? But so this is one way why stories are working really well. But what I think is m much more interesting and much more relevant and, and much more transferable to the design of educational experiences is if you think about the fact that we, we remember in story form, mm -hmm. right? We don't remember facts or figures, we remember the moment we learned that, or we remember the story within which that fact makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So we, our memory works in story form. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the most relevant experiences in our lives, we remember as stories, mm -hmm. right? So if we want a training course or a workshop or a seminar or a conference or a class to be memorable, we need to think of it as what is the story that I want people to remember when they remember what we talked about at this workshop, mm -hmm. right? And so you can design a workshop, you can design a conference, you can design a training course with the same building blocks that you can use to create stories, mm. right? So there's this very popular theory on how 
stories are structured and story architecture called The Hero's Journey. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure you've heard of it, right? By Joseph Campbell. It has 17 steps. It's a lot of steps. Uh, a couple of years after him, a screenwriter called Ben Harmon, mm-hmm. who is, uh, you know, he, he made Rick and Morty and Community uh, a lot more slapstick, a lot more, you know, not quite as, you know, mythological <laughs> and not, not quite as serene. Uh, but he took those 17 steps and he turned them into eight steps that he uses to create jokes and stories and story structures for sitcoms and for movies and stuff. And those eight steps, they work remarkably well as a guiding principle or as steps or design principles in creating workshops or seminars or conferences, learning experiences generally. Yeah. Mm. Can you guide us through the steps and how you would apply them to workshops? Yeah, so the, uh, the eight steps, you, which is the protagonist, right? Protagonist, need, go, search, find, take, change, return. Mm-hmm. Return, change. You, need, go, search, find, take, return, change. Mm. It's essentially the main structure that every story you've ever read, <laughs> besides some very avant-garde stories that don't make any sense to people that you know just want entertainment. But the most mainstream stories ever, from Star Wars to Harry Potter, yeah, from Star Wars to Harry Potter to Lord of the Rings to you know every rom-com ever, uh, follows essentially those eight steps, right? And so in a workshop, you can do that with, okay, stage one, protagonist, right? What we need to do in that stage is establish the learners as protagonists, Mm. right? Where a lot of workshops go wrong is if the workshop is about the facilitator, right? I was about to bring that up. I was like, you? Well, I think you don't mean the facilitator because you is the group. Okay. You is the group or it's the, yeah. Yeah. You as the group or you as the individual learner, mm-hmm. right? The protagonist. Yeah. And so we need to establish that it's about them, mm-hmm. right? And, and we need to do that by learning about their world, by learning o- about their pressures, about their, you know, what, how their life looks like, how their, what is important to them, what isn't important to them. Like all of this. Thing. Yes, exactly. A stakeholder mapping, essentially, but yeah. also just a moment in the beginning of the workshop that signalizes or that symbolizes you are the most important here. Yeah. Mm. So, so there's, for example, one uh, way I, I often start seminars or workshops or things that are a bit longer, like five day things, uh, uh, which is we don't start with the participants come in, sit down and they get told what the program and the objectives are. But we do something called a, a, a welcome space. And so the participants come in, there's just music playing, there's a flip chart in the middle that says, this is your space, make it your own. And there's a few corners, you know, like a program space, like a, a concept space where the participants can start with mind maps about the important concepts about what this thing is about, etc., etc. So it starts with them. And it starts with their initiative. They decide where they go first. They decide how to contribute. And it starts with them, you know. Mm. Or at a conference, the way how you design the name tags can have an impact, right? Or the way how you create just the first experience where you realize that this is about me and the fact that I am here to learn something, not about the fact that this trainer or facilitator thinks they're pretty awesome. Right? Because that is not enticing. Right? And then the second stage, need, is then about the gap between how things are and how things could be. Right? Because learning is exhausting. Right? Learning is not nice. Right? Learning is not easy. Right? Yeah. It's, it's very hard to learn something, particularly when it's something difficult or when it's something that forces you to change your idea about who you are or that it forces you to change a perspective it's painful right so it needs to be worth it Mm -hmm. right and and without it being worth it without there being a clear need a clear gap between this is how things are and this is how things could be Mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get them into the into then the the search phase right uh 
So the most beautiful thing we can give a, a learner or a workshop participants at that stage is a, a personal question mark, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a question that they have that comes from within themselves. And experiential learning exercises are a great way to to trigger those, right? You do an experiential learning exercise where you put them in a position where they don't think too much about how they behave. They just behave because you create, you know, some artificial pressure or you create some process that lets people become more emotional than analytical mm -hmm. and suddenly they see themselves behaving in a way that isn't up to their own standards or suddenly they behave in a way that is ethnocentric and not as you know tolerant and open-minded as they thought they are or where they actually make assumptions about people where they thought they don't make assumptions etc et and then you example for such an exercise i'm intrigued yeah there's One very popular exercise in the intercultural field is called uh, Baranga, which is a card game. Uh, you have different uh, tables. People play a very simple uh, a card game, and each table has basically the same rules. There's just some nuances that are different. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, we're going to make a tournament now. And so people play at their tables, and then they have to go to another table for the next round of the tournament. And suddenly they realize, oh, they... There's something different here, right? But they're not allowed to talk during this exercise. And so they suddenly have to realize or have to figure out how to to do that. And what happens very often is, for example, the people that are already at the table then dominate the newcomers, right? Or what happens sometimes is when a newcomer comes as someone who won at, this, at their previous table, they uh, impose their rules because they already have this attitude of, I come here as a winner. The strategy doesn't work anymore because the world's changed. Exactly. Yep. And so you can really reflect on, okay, but how did you react when some suddenly someone behaved in a way that for you means it's inappropriate. It's a rule violation from your perspective. It's not a rule violation from their perspective. And so you can reflect It's about that. Between Germans reacting to that and Indians reacting to that. <laughs> not even that. Like I, I've done this with German civil servants and I had one participant who just, you know, I would say did a complete trump, which was that uh, she came in. She just pretended like she is right the whole time because she understood that no one knew what rules she originally had. And so she just pretended she's right the whole time and just kept on taking. And the others were too polite to say something, right? So it was, uh, and the others were so frustrated, but it was a, such a teachable moment, you know? It was such a, a way, because this is sometimes how expats behave when they go abroad and they uh, come in as a leader or as a manager and they suddenly say like, no, this, 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 and this, and everybody's upset and they don't even realize that everybody's upset. And then the problem in this situation, I lived in Vietnam for three years mm. and then what I saw is that then the, the Asians or the Vietnamese, namely, they were too polite to say anything. So it was yeah. exactly the same situation where then men yeah. failed totally. Just yeah. they impose their rules and nobody dares to tell them that they're playing with the wrong, under the wrong assumptions. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so you can, Great, yeah. through the debriefing of that, you can give people these question marks. Uh -huh. You know? Okay, so I interrupted you on the flow of... Um... Oh, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, and so you need to draw this gap. And sometimes you can do that also already beforehand in individual conversations with the different workshops participants to say like, okay, what should we achieve here? What gap do you see? And then you can like show the map of what you have found out. It's just important that it makes it clear that all the str struggle we're going to go through It's worth it, you know. It it's it's worth it in the end to go through that, you know. And then you go, which means you change the gear from. Just one second, so sure. interrupt. So how how do you define the need? So you define the struggle. Yeah. So who sets the goal? Is it the group beforehand? Is it kind of the workshop purpose that was predefined, or? Would you also give this to the group? It depends very much on what it is that you want to achieve. What's important is that it becomes clear. Okay. Right. What's important is that, and the, what you, 
it can have is that the organization has a certain goal for the workshop. The participants have a very different goal for the workshop, yes. right? It happens very often, yeah. And then you need to bring both of it to the table and you say, okay, this is what we need to achieve from this stakeholder's perspective. This is what we need to achieve from this stakeholder's perspective. What are we going to do now? Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, but when it's about... Uh, you know, a predefined objective about learning, you know, not about, you know, creating something together in a workshop setting, but about a training course where there's a clear, okay, these are the learning objectives. Then what needs to be achieved in that moment is that the participants have an experience of, oh, yeah, it makes sense for me to learn this. It's not anymore just something that someone else wants me to learn. It's now become something that I want to learn. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes absolute sense. Thank you. Cool. And then you go, uh, which is, you know, it can be a very explicit moment where you have people fill in learning journals where they set out their own objectives or their uh, their hopes and fears or whatever. You have can establish learning buddies where they talk with each other about what it is that they are, you know, excited about or what they're scared about. Or you, it, in a the conference I once did, it was essentially just the movement from the group from the plenary room to the workshop rooms you know like and that marked kind of the change of gear that marked the uh the transition from here it is still in the known and now we move into the unknown mm. and that's then the search phase mm -hmm. right and this is probably where the activities happen that we most commonly think about when we think about learning right this is where lectures happen this is where podcasts can be listened to this is where books can be read this is where we can have group work or where we can have you know it's about experimentation it's about failing interestingly and repeating that and failing again and repeating that and experimenting and struggling but developing you know forward mm -hmm. failing forward exactly and then hopefully at the like at the bottom of the circle, you know, like the, the darkest point mm -hmm. is hopefully where people find something. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the way down in a way is a very much controlled process by the facilitator or trainer, yeah. this is a moment that as much as we want to control it, we can't control it all that much, mm -hmm. right? Because we can't ever really fully say like, I'm going to tell you what you are going to find because people f may find different things, right? But this is where in the uh, story circle of Joseph Campbell, he calls it meeting with the goddess. Mm -hmm. And I like that. You know, that's a nice, uh, nice idea. It's kind of the, it's the aha moment. It's the, it's where the lamp suddenly, you know, the light bulb starts to, the bling, where a perspective has changed, where a paradigm has shifted, where something is finally not just understood superficially, but understood deeply. You know, like uh, this this moment of, oh, wow, okay, okay, okay. And now I understand, this. <laughs> you know, like this moment. And this is probably not where we can design a process that is really like, boom, this is going to happen at this moment, but where we need to create kind of a an environment and a process where finding that is a lot more likely than without the process. Yeah. You know, like where we can have these quiet reflection moments or where we can have conversations between participants or where we can have coaching moments or where we can have learning journal entries, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel you're tired of the trip from home? To the home office? Do the physical confines of your house are not getting you the exposure to the new ideas that you need? Maybe you need Mastermind. At Mastermind, you work together with a group of peers who help you bring new perspectives to your challenges, to find new solutions, and who you can even give a little bit back to by helping them solve their problems. In a compressed two hours, you'll get a day's worth of learning. So why don't you get out of that box and come to Mastermind? workshops.work slash mastermind. I guess that it's these aha moments are very individual as well. Yeah. But I guess that if you have a larger group, there will be those who the moment you start, 
they already have the light bulb yeah. which illuminate the entire room whereas all the rest is just sitting in the dark like what <laughs> so yeah. how would you how would you deal with these differences in pace ideally you have a bit of time right uh, where people who understand something and are happy with it can sit with it for a while and play with it for a while and those who need a little bit more time to really understand it or to understand what it is that they need to understand mm -hmm. they have the resources or they have the support or they have the offers to really manifest that that understanding right so this and and what really works is to have a lot of different methods to have a lot of different moments to have a lot of different environments some people thrive in public settings like the whole group sits together and they can just publicly think aloud <laughs> and 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 some others just need a quiet evening you know and some others need just one-on-one -on -one time with someone who they trust and some others just need uh, to experiment more you know to to do something with it and then see how it feels so just to have a lot of different like to have a lot of methodological diversity is i think crucial to allow for this multifaceted approach to the insights yeah yeah and if someone doesn't get it well they're not gonna get it then you know <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a thing that is not forcible you can't force people to learn something and and mostly if someone doesn't get it if someone doesn't learn what it is that they need to learn mm -hmm. or what it is that is there to be learned mm -hmm. and if they don't learn it it means that it didn't correspond to a need it means that beforehand you didn't see them it means that beforehand you didn't understand what it is that they need right if uh, it's it's like when you cook a, a three course meal that has a lot of meat and uh, you know eggs and cheese in it and and you try to feed a bunch of vegans and they're not eating anything it doesn't mean that they're not hungry it just means that what you cooked isn't what they can eat right with a brilliant example <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely and i what i like about this reflection is the responsibility on the trainer or facilitator to provide the space um, and taking away this pressure from the learner or participant that it's it's not something forcible but then yeah something was wrong with the recipe or maybe they needed to learn something else yeah to me this this first step to establish the participants as the protagonists mm. to me this is really the the fundamental and crucial part if someone doesn't learn what it is that you thought you had designed a process to learn mm -hmm. it means that you didn't design it for them yeah you know it, it means that you had a different idea on who these people are mm. right and to me facilitation is an act of love mm. right you need to love the humanity of the people that you are allowed to accompany, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so if you really see them, and you may not like them, right? Mm -hmm. That's fine. But behind the not liking part of every human being that there can be, there is a, a human being inside of that, right? That has trauma, that has needs, that has ambitions, that has wishes, that has an environment that exerts certain pressures on them, that has an environment that exerts certain expectations onto them, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so they will behave within that system that they are in. Yeah. And, and they will behave in a way that is logical within that system. And so if you want to help someone learn something that is going to make their life worse, right that is going to make it harder for them to be appreciated by the people who they want to be appreciated by you're gonna have a really hard time yeah 
<laughs> you know, because you're not offering something they need, which doesn't mean that they don't actually need that. Mm -hmm. Right. If you work with an organization and it's a very sexist, muscle, like macho organization mm -hmm. and it's just horrible and it's just, you know, a lot of men everywhere that behave in inappropriate ways, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and you offer in appropriate uh, ways, a yeah. toxic environment, mm -hmm. a toxic environment. And you offer them a diversity workshop or you offer them a nonviolent communication workshop or you offer them a, you know, a, a non-discrimination workshop or something like that. And somehow you get to do it for them, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can start with, all right, I'm right, you all are wrong and here's <laughs> how you should behave from now on, even though that doesn't make any sense in your system, right? It, it means you need to tone down your expectations and look at, you know, what is it where you can touch something in the people that resonates with them? And why are they behaving that way? So what is yes. it that triggers and that maintains this kind of culture of sexism and discrimination? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very, like to, it, to facilitate a learning process, to me, it, it requires a lot of humility mm -hmm. and it requires a lot of, distance from your own um, mm. expectations or from your own ideas of what is uh, important mm -hmm. in life. Yeah. It shouldn't, however, be an act that is not value-based, mm -hmm. right? So to me, it's, it's really important not to say, okay, you're a bunch of racists i'm going to accept that and you know let's see how to make this place better no that is like a, a human rights starting point of okay there is a wrong and right in this world and the human rights declaration is kind of the basic documents that we can use to evaluate that and let's not go beyond that but besides that you know like to tell people their value system if it doesn't impede other people or if it doesn't hurt other people there's nothing wrong with that, you know, mm. and to, yeah, it's, it's a tricky process sometimes to, to love your learners. Yes. Yes. It takes a lot of self-awareness to, yeah. to be triggered. Not to be triggered. And sometimes it requires a good co-facilitator or a good co-trainer who you can sit with over a glass of wine in the evening and just, you know, <laughs> and just, you know, talk about the, the participants who you both don't like but then when you're in the training room you act professionally and yeah. just try to see the humanity again. yeah 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 so true okay so after the light bulb moment after the light bulb we have then the take phase mm -hmm. right and this i call this phase kind of the the incorporation phase mm -hmm. where the the learners need to incorporate this insight mm -hmm. right because at the moment the light bulb is still they are next to them, right? And it's still detached from them. And, and to me, this incorporation means like to literally make it part of your body, right? Incorporare, right? Make it a part of your body. Make it a part of who you are now, which means working with it, which means figuring out what is my way of expressing this, the fact that I am now someone who is able to do this, or I am now someone who knows this, or I am now someone who looks at the world with this perspective, yeah. right? And to to play with that and to kind of try it on and walk around in it a little bit to see how it, how it fits. Mm -hmm. And that is something that in a lot of trainings or a lot of seminars is sometimes missed as well, mm -hmm. right? A lot of trainings, like traditional trainings or traditional seminars or classes focus on the search and the uh, find, right? You have the lectures and then you have the exam and that's kind of the search and the find, right? But it's not yet incorporated. It's not yet become something that someone considers part of their, their self now, right? Yeah. And just to build on your example, I was just wondering if I need a new jacket, I said, yeah. I find one. I would never yeah. buy it without trying it on. And maybe if it's a very expensive jacket, showing it to the people I tr whose opinion I trust to see whether yeah. it's really suitable. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And to just like, okay, it, 
when I wear this jacket and I look in the mirror, do I see a version of myself that I like? You know, is this yeah. is this who I am when I yeah. when I wear this? You know, and the same is with with knowledge and with skills, right? Totally. Trying out how I behave when I speak with nonverbal uh, with uh, nonviolent communication techniques and the way how I sound then. Mm -hmm. Is that how I would like to sound like? Is that someone who I like better than the person who didn't have the skills to speak about conflictual issues in this way, for example? Yeah. And maybe also just to give the space to experiment with it, because at yeah. first it might sound strange, like, oh, this doesn't feel natural to me to yeah. ask all these questions and to yeah. yes and everything. Yeah. When before I yes, but everything yeah. to give them the time to cost them to play around, to make it their yeah. own. Yeah. 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 Or in trainings for trainers, it's where uh, people run their own training modules and experience themselves as trainers in front of a group of their peers and experiment with different yeah. methods or with different methodologies or whatever. Yeah. You know? Mm. And then, so that's the, the take phase. And then you have the return phase, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I mean, it can be just saying goodbye and people return. Uh, mm -hmm. But ideally, it's actually thinking about how you bring this new knowledge or this new way of acting or this new perspective back into the, your old reality. Mm. You know, who in your old reality has a completely reasonable interest for you not to use what you've learned here? Uh, what who potential roadblocks? Mm -hmm. Yes, but also who in your old reality really wanted you to learn this and is going to be an ally now? What are the ways how you can integrate what you have? Like it's from incorporation to integration, right? Mm -hmm. How can you integrate? your new way of of thinking or your new way of being or your new way of knowing into the world that hasn't been here mm. yeah yeah and that again is something that we typically don't spend a lot of time on because time is a very scarce a resource but it's something that is really powerful when you can do it to do it yeah because it it allows for a, a very a more mature way to think about strategically mm -hmm. how do i want to make this one day or two day or three day workshop sustainable how do i want to make it worth it you know was it just three days where i had fun thinking in strange ways but now i go back and act like i've always have yeah. or in what ways can i actually make this take roots and, and become part of, of the world that wasn't here yeah, yeah. And how? who are the people who can really support me and how do I deal with those who might want my old self? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of, not that I have personal experience with that, but anonymous alcoholics so yeah. if, or, if, or drug addicts. So if yeah. you want to return into your normal life, you have to think, okay, who are actually my codependents who would yeah. like me to stay in this addiction because it makes mm. them feel better? And who mm. are the people who actually support me in turning my life around and having this better life? Yeah. And by being conscious about it, it's much easier to go out and to implement it. Yeah. Um, and to be ready also for the obstacles that might wait there. Yeah, absolutely. Like this is really important when you do strategy workshops with management teams or when you do mission and vision establishment workshops or when you just do team building retreats or also when you do intercultural workshops or communication workshops or, or trainings around conflict resolution. It's... Um, I can perfectly see that, yeah. Yeah, like a training room or a workshop room is a very magical place, right? There's markers and flip charts and, there's, you know, there's snacks. <laughs> togetherness and energy. And togetherness and energy and there's a mutual support and you don't have any other things to do, right? You don't have to check your emails. You don't have to please your boss. It's a very safe space, which it should be. 
right? Yeah. But it, it also makes it very enticing to think afterwards like, oh, yeah, yeah, in this training room, in the safe space, I could be more tender, I could be more caring, I could be more empathetic, but now I have to, you know, it's a jungle out here. And you know, now I, I, it's, not for, it's not for here. So it's, it's important to think about that, that transfer. And even if it's not your own thing, but I think the workshop room is also like a bubble. So everyone yeah. in this room, you created something together and then there's this optimism that of course it will work. So it's this combination yeah. of positive energy, maybe overconfidence. Yeah. As soon as this bubble is taken apart and you're just an individual, it's so much yeah. harder to convince the others. Yeah. I, I learned in a recent episode from, uh, from Douglas Ferguson, what he does is he, in, a, in the last phase of a sprint before leaving, he is taking time to design the narrative. What is actually the story we're telling about this? this yeah. So that's exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Can go out and tell the same story and feel comfortable yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, and not just say, oh, that was a fun workshop. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's exactly this, to, uh, to know how you are going to bring this back. Yeah. You know, to, to have the confidence and the, and the clarity yes. about these are the obstacles, this is how I overcome them, this is how I make this worth it, this is how I make this whole work that I just went through, yeah. this whole emotional labor, uh, this creativity, this is how I make it last. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And then the last stage is change, where you know, hopeful. Hopefully, the learners have changed, and hopefully, the environment that they bring the change into will then change as a result of it. Right? But this is where we really don't have any power anymore as facilitators or trainers. This is where it's really all up to the learners. Then. Thank you. That was so insightful. Thank you. It's very simple. And I think a lot of trainers or facilitators intuitively work this way, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like it's not in any way or form radically out of the box. I think like what this approach for me really helped was to to clarify an intuitively sensible process mm -hmm. and to give me a structure where I can in the design phase or in the evaluation phase or in the implementation phase, I can check if the things that I have done yeah. lead to what I'm doing next and if I'm building a logical flow, basically. Yeah. But I, I don't think that any trainer will find it or any facilitator will find it counterintuitive. Yeah. I think it's a very intuitive uh, way. <laughs> And it's in simplicity that hides yeah. the wisdom and the power. Yeah. So according to you, what makes a workshop fail? A workshop fails when it's, it's not embedded in the world of the participants of the workshop. Mm -hmm. When the participants of the workshop are irrelevant mm -hmm. <laughs> with regards to what they can bring to it. You know, when it's not important to give them space and to be seen and to be acknowledged and appreciated for what it is that they offer, right? Yeah, and if it's not embedded in the overall context and the overall world where this happens, you know, when you organize a workshop and it's about something that is ignoring or is pretending to happen in a reality that isn't there, mm -hmm. then it's, it's going to fail, you know? Yeah. Nice. If someone in the audience fell asleep after minute one, just woke up and thinks, oh my goodness, I don't have time to listen to all of that again. What would you like them <laughs> to, to have in mind or to take away from this show? To continuously see the learners as complex human beings who are not just there as participants of a workshop, but who have a whole system that they are embedded in and who have a whole world that they belong to, that they bring with them to the workshop mm -hmm. and to 
work with that and to really put yourself in a situation of, of a guide, of a respectful companion that is on a journey that has been invited to be on this journey, mm. that has no mandate to tell anybody what they are supposed to think, mm -hmm. but that continuously requires the generosity of the learners to give them access to their mind, basically. No. I think that for me would be the core of it. Nice. So when are you writing a book about your concept? Oh, I have written a book about it. Oh, so I will put the link in the show notes. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I find it on Amazon? Yes. Wonderful. It's called The Learner's Journey. Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> it had a couple of names beforehand <laughs> in the in the in the drafting phase, but then this emerged as a as a suggestion and I thought, yes, of course it needs to be called after, this. After one hour in a conversation with you, there's no other title that could fit. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's a it's a fitting title, I think. Great. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights and expertise with us sure it was a true light bulb oh no <laughs> yeah thank you very much for you know inviting me and and thank you for giving me a forum to to talk about this it's uh you do very important work and i'm very thankful to you thank you thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show i appreciate your attention as i know how busy you are if you enjoyed it Please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.